morning and welcome to our effect our event on the capacity building on codex topics module two basic codex texts and we will be discussing some basic issues about uh, foods we have our first uh, uh, speaker is giuseppe di Chiera from the codex secretariat and we're very pleased to have you here welcome giuseppe we know that this is going to be a very uh, full and interesting um morning for all of us and and we can start after i give some explanations and about the event first of all after your your presentation we will have a q a session and at that point we can all turn on our cameras and microphones and then you can also send your questions via the chat and we'll pick them all and uh, submit them to you and we remind you also that we have interpretation services and you can che choose the language that you would like to follow this meeting uh, on and um, and please before you speak or when you speak please uh, say your name and the country from where you are connecting and i think without further ado thank you very much once again and welcome all and giuseppe you have the floor Thank you very much, Daniela, and thank you very much uh, to the ACT project, to Ecuador, to the Republic of Korea for organizing uh, this interesting uh, series of webinars. Uh, my name is Giuseppe Di Creria. For those of you who don't know me, I am uh, a program specialist with the Codex Secretariat. Uh, my background is in law and economics with a master's degree in law and development. I'm um, really happy to see so many familiar faces with us here today. So happy to see also people that I am meeting for the first time. Um, I really want this webinar to be a chat. I really want this webinar to be uh, something that we can, you know, share also with our colleagues. But I really want to engage with you. So in case you have uh, questions, doubts, please feel free to uh, send us uh, your questions, your doubts using the chat. Uh, take note of your questions. And as uh, Daniela was saying just a few minutes ago, we will uh, address your questions also at the end of this uh, session. Uh, please mute your mic if you're not speaking. That would be, would be really fantastic, not just for me, because my level of attention is really low, but also for our interpreters. I'm gonna switch every now and then from English to Spanish for, yeah, this is an information for the interpreters mainly. Um, so what are we gonna talk about today? Well, we're gonna talk about the basic codex texts. Um, but I, you know, my background is also uh, about music. I'm a musician, I play different instruments. And although I really love the sound of music, I don't like to listen to the sound of my voice for too long. So if you don't mind, I'd like you to play with me. So if you have some, uh, if you have your cell phone in, in front of you, or if you can just go to menti.com and enter the code 3444017. So go to menti.com and enter the code 3444017 or use the QR code that you see here with your cell phone. Um, this is just a way to know each other a bit better, to uh, get familiar with uh, the topics that we are gonna discuss today together. I see a few hearts already appearing on the screen. Thank you very much. I'm gonna just wait for, for a, a few seconds. And in the meantime, uh, let me tell you the topics of today's webinar. So we're going to talk about basic codex texts, uh, which include, of course, codex standards, the guidelines, the codes of practice. We're going to have a look at the standards, codes of practice, guidelines, trying to understand, to better understand what they mean, how we use them, how we develop these standards as well. And then we're going to have a look at, uh, the, at the circular letters and at the invitations for electronic working groups, which also are a core part of Codex work. And finally, we will uh, see together what I call the other documents, 
including, for example, the information documents or the publications that are available on the Codex website that are also part of Codex work. So I see, wow, quite a lot of people already online. So with your permission, I'd like to go to the first one, so the first slide. Should my internet help me? Yes. So maybe too much. Okay, here we go. So where are you from? So my question, first question for you is, where are you from? I would like to know if you're from the Codex contact point, from the private sector, from a national Codex committee. So I see some people from the national Codex committee, uh, private sector, uh, happy to welcome you. Uh, today, really important for us to know that there are also people coming from the private sector, NGOs, other, okay, I'm curious to know what other uh, people participating in the meeting so where uh, are, um, wait, I see, okay, my internet is slowing, refreshing, but I see now uh, more people from the National Codex Committee, Codex Contact Point as well. So, Daniela, we have a quite uh different audience uh many people from different uh entities which is really good um moving on to the next one um how much do you know about codex uh no experience some experience have lots of experience that would be fantastic and i mean i'm really looking forward to seeing anyone that worked with codex for over 10 years uh, maybe in that case, I will give the mic directly to that person. Okay, we have one person. Uh, I guess I know who this person is. Well, probably by reading wow. the, the the list of participants, I know who these persons are. Really happy to have you with us today. Um, so some of you have some experience with Codex. Others have little to no experience. Of course, uh, I'm happy to see that uh, many people have already quite a lot of experience in Codex. The final one would be this one, this question. When I hear the words Codex Elementarius, I think about, so enter your, your uh, favorite word or words even. Uh, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when we talk about Codex? I see science, food safety, food standards, discussions, debates, Science again, uh, laws, safe food, okay, food codes, true, harmonization, okay, I see many words coming in, interesting, rules as well, rules about food, good standards, okay, again, harmonization, okay, Qu quite a lot of results. Well, um, this is really, really interesting because that is actually uh, sort of defined, um, is defining how people see uh, Codex, how people um, uh, imagine what Codex actually is. And, you know, thank you very much. Let me, let me stop here. Um, we, Whenever we talk about codex, every people, every person has a different definition for codex, right? So what is my definition of codex? That is really interesting because my definition for codex was, let's say, a bit different. Um, as I was mentioning to you, my uh, background is in law and economics. And, uh, you know, when I joined codex, uh, I didn't really... Uh, study what codex was or is so uh my boss who i don't know is on if he's online at the moment tom island told me well you have to read the procedural manual which is one again of the basic codex text that we will uh, um, analyze together today but my idea what i got from from tom what i got from reading the procedural manual is that basically if you eat an apple in Tokyo, Roma, Los Angeles, uh, Ciudad del Mexico, it doesn't matter where you eat it, you know that this apple won't kill you. Well, unless you are Snow White, won't kill you because there is a codex standard for that, ensuring that this apple doesn't have uh, um, too many pesticides or pesticides that will hurt you, that uh, this, pest, this apple was traded uh, following codex 
standards. Now, this was my definition of codex. So it's something that protects you, that allows you to eat an apple, no matter where you are in the world. Because as you know, as we say, if it isn't safe, well, it isn't food. So what is Codex? Uh, Codex is about protecting health and facilitating trade. Um, Codex is a process and a result. A process because the Codex Alimentarius Commission organized the process to convene members and observers and develop standards. We have more than 180 members, uh, currently 189 members, uh, 188 countries plus the European Union. And although Codex is a member-driven organization, it is really important for us to have also more than 240 observers uh, from NGOs, from IGOs, from other UN organizations as well, because Codex would have little if no authority, I would say, in the field of international food standards if it was not for the contribution also of the private sector, of NGOs, IGOs. Just think, for example, about uh, listening to the voice of consumer. Uh, we have several consumers' organizations now attending and actively participating in Codex. And we're going to see also the differences between what an observer can do and what a member can do. Because again, let me stress it one more time, the Codex Elementaris Commission is a member-driven organization, which means that, for example, members uh, decide on the agenda of the Codex Alimentarius Commission. But as many of you were saying in the initial work cloud, um, Codex is also a result. When we think about Codex, we think about a food code. We think about a collection of standards, guidelines, uh, codes of practice as well, that um, uh, sort of regulate the food that we can eat every day. So I will start exactly from here. Um, we talk about codex text, and when we talk about codex text, the first text that we think of are standards, guidelines, and codex practice. What people tend to forget, although, when we talk about codex text, is that codex text uh, including standards, guidelines, and code of practice are recommendations, meaning that their application is voluntary. Uh, what does it mean? It means that um, member countries need to take legal steps at national level to incorporate code of guidance into their uh, legislation or regulation for it to be, uh, let me say, enforceable. Um, so this is really important also at WTO level. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to use the Codex language quite frequently um, in uh, uh, during this uh, webinar. And uh, I see that my boss, Tom, is already uh, with us. And he was the one teaching me the language of, of, of Codex when I first joined uh, Codex. Because in Codex, we don't really use... Uh, we don't really say World Trade Organization. We say WTO. We don't really say the Codex Committee on Food Hygiene. We say CCFH. So um, WTO. So I'm going to uh, use these acronyms. So um, Codex uh, standards became particularly relevant um, also due to the creation of the WTO and the relevant agreement. Uh, what does it mean? It means, for example, that the SPS agreement uh, identifies the standards of the Codex Alimentarius Commission for, for example, for food additives, veterinary drugs, pesticide residues, contaminants. We're going to have a look at all these different sections during the, um, uh, the uh, webinar as the uh, benchmark. Um, which means that, for example, WTO members wishing to set stricter food safety standards than codex standards may be required to provide evidence as to the let me say scientific nature of their of their measures in case of a trade dispute for example and uh, currently codex standards prevent and assist in the resolution of trade disputes before wto 
in both the SPS and TBT agreement. But I see that my boss, Tom Island, is online, and I know he can unfortunately stay with us for five minutes only. Um, so I take the opportunity of having uh, Tom with us. And Tom, if you can turn on your camera so that I can be sure that you are here with me even now. Um, I have one, one question for you. And once again, Tom, thank you very much for, for taking the time uh, for being with us. Tom Island is the secretary of the Codex Alimentarius Commission. Um, Tom, my question for you would be, as this webinar is about Codex text, Codex standards and so on, why should people be interested in Codex standards and why are they so important today? Tom, if you don't mind, you, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. And my camera, I think, is on, right? Yes. Uh, at least I can see myself. I hope you can all see myself as well. So, and it's good to see some of you uh, on the screen. I see most of the screen is the is the presentation. A great presentation, by the way. It's it was nice to see that somebody's listening to me uh, when I talk and when I teach them the language. So, <laughs> great, great job so far. And um, I, I like particularly the to display codex always as a process and a result. Um, and I always think that we learn as much in the process of building a codex standard um, as we then learn from the standard. And it's 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 different people also who learn different things in different um, in the different um, times that we work on codex. For example, if we get together in the technical committee, in the working groups, in the commission, we form networks between countries, um, people who would otherwise not meet if they would not never work together on a codex standard. And they meet and they later, um, they tell me, I mean, oh, yeah, when I have a problem in whatever, in this country, I know who to call. I know that I can contact somebody. And this is really great. So codex is, we say the codex family, right? But it's really a big network. And um, then, of course, we have the codex standards. Now, why should you know about codex? Uh, Giuseppe, um, before you joined Codex, did, had you ever heard the word Codex? No, probably not. No, no. I, um, I myself, I heard it a little bit earlier uh, than joining Codex. I heard it when I had my previous job and a colleague of mine said, Tom, you're applying for this job in food and you don't know what the Codex Alimentarius is. This is the Codex Alimentarius. And he showed me like a whole shelf of books, uh, which was the um, the physical version of the Codex Alimentarius that we had at the time. And you should know about it. And obviously, yes, I needed to know about it because I was applying for a job in food standards. Um, now, does the consumer need to know about us? Well, the consumer can live without knowing about us. But I always think if you want to be an informed consumer, it's better um, that you know what's happening. It's better that you know what your government is doing. Um, what is your government doing for my food safety, for my food quality, for food trade, for that I have enough food, that I have good food available? Um, so it's important um, because the codex standards form the basis. They don't do everything, but it is a good international basis for providing, for being able to provide safe and good quality food to everyone. So I think, yes, it's useful to know about it, uh, regardless in a way where you work, because we all have to eat. Um, and, and obviously, if you're working in a ministry, if you're working in the private sector, um, even more, if you're working in the food industry, if you're working in, um, in the agriculture ministry, the, the health ministry, the trade ministry, yes, you should know about Codex. Was that enough? Does that... <laughs> it was more than enough. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. Thank you very much, Tom Island, Codex Secretary. And thank you for taking some time and uh, for being here with us. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thanks a lot and take care. Good luck with the seminar. Thank you. Um, so where were we? Uh, we were talking about the Codex Standards Guidelines and Code of Practices, uh, Code, Codes of Practice, which are the basically the most famous products of the Codex Alimentarius Commission. After that, the first distinction that actually my boss told me a long time ago, more than, well, let's say almost eight years ago, uh, was that we have two standards, basically. We can have codex standards that are general or codex standards that are specific. Um, we have, for example, when we talk about codex standards, guidelines, and code of practice that are general, 
we mean that these um, basically these are the core codex texts. These apply to all products and product categories. These texts basically typically deal with, for example, hygiene practice, uh, with uh, hygienic practice, with labeling, with additives, with inspection and certification. Think about, for example, nutrition as well. Think about residues of veterinary drugs and pesticides in food as well. So these are uh, the some codex standards. So let me give you an example. For example, food additives are fully regulated in the uh, codex general standard for food additives. I hope I pronounced the acronym correct because once again, we, we usually say C, uh, GSFA, the uh, Codex General Standard for Food Additives. Um, this standard is one of the most important standard that we have online, one of the most downloaded standard, and it clearly lays out the principle, uh, the principles for using additives and defines also the, the maximum use levels. And it is so important that this standard is also available as a database on the Codex website. Um, not going to spend so much time on how to find codex standards, where to find them, how to open them, how to read them, because we're going to have a look at that exactly at the end of this uh, session. Other codex general standards, for example, uh, in, another one is the codex general standard for contaminants in food and feed, which define, again, principles that set, sets limits for a number of uh, contaminants and um, is also uh, this uh, this standard is also available on the Codex uh, website. Again, think about uh, the Codex General Standard for labeling of prepackaged food. I mean, we can go on for for quite a lot because these standards actually are really important for for uh, for Codex because uh, they basically um, uh, become also the reference for other standards. And we're gonna see an example. Uh, in, a, in a few seconds. Um, then we have what we call the specific standards or also the commodity standards, which refer, for example, to specific uh, commodities. Let me also give you um, a bit of background because uh, in the 60s, when Codex, uh, 60s, when Codex was founded, actually in 1963, uh, and next year Codex will actually turn 60, um, Codex, let's say, in those years, took the approach of setting standards applicable to individual foods. Now, with time, this turned out to be, uh, let me say, impractical, both for keeping standards up to date and for the implementation as well. And after that, we gave way to the practice of creating uh, group standards, uh, which means, for example, uh, we now have a general standard for fruit juices and nectars which replaced the previous standards, plural, for individual fruit juices. So again, codex standards, we start with standards, guidelines, code of practice, and now we know that we have codex standards that can be general or specific. Let me give you a, an example of a, a codex text. This is a, a codex commodity standard. This is the... Um, standard for kiwi fruit uh, recently adopted by uh, the commission developed by CCFFV the codex committee on fresh fruits and vegetables you see why we use acronym because in codex we are lazy and we want to save time so CCFFV um usually commodity standards include the name uh, of, of the product include for example the scope of a product uh, which includes, of course, uh, the name of the food to which the standard applies, and in most cases, the purpose for which the commodity will be used. You will also find in the standards weights and measures, which contains provisions such as fill of the container and the dread weight of the commodity. Uh, well, the description that, as the name would suggest, includes a definition of, of the product or products covered with the for example, uh, an indication uh, where appropriate of the raw material from which they are derived, the essential composition. And if you look at the right column, you will see uh, the reference to the relevant general standards. In this case, for example, you can see that there is a clear reference 
to the um, uh, maximum levels of the established in the general standard for contaminants and toxins in food and feed. And these uh, uh, references, references are available in almost all uh, codex standards. And when a, a standard is sort of uh, updated, uh, such updates should be reflected also in all uh, codex standards. And I see many of you attended the um, a recent uh, session of the codex committee for the uh, LAC region. And as you recall, we uh, discussed together um, the how to implement, how to update the regional standard um, following the, uh, prov the new provisions included in the labeling standards. Now, this is more or less what a commodity standard look like, but we talked about codex standards, guidelines, and code of practice. Guidelines and codes of practice fall into two major categories. When we talk about guidelines, um, we have we have principles that set out policy in certain key areas. I think about, again, food additives, contaminants, food hygiene. Um, these are basically the main areas. Uh, but we also have guidelines for the interpretation of principle or for the interpretation and extension of provision of codex general standards. Um, just to give you an example, we have a guideline on nutrition labeling. Uh, which is, if I call correctly, if I study correctly, it's called CXG2-1985. Again, CXG is another acronym, which means CODEX, CX, CODEX, and the G is for guidelines. Um, this labeling, uh, um, this guideline on nutrition labeling, for example, um, ensure that nutrition labeling in, is effective, for example, in providing the consumer, in providing the consumer, uh, sorry, with, uh, with information about food so they can make a, a wise choice of food when they actually buy the food. Um, or, for example, in providing a means for convening information of the nutrient content of a food on the label. And then we have, of course, the cause of practice. They also fall into two major categories. The first one, cause of uh, hygienic practice for individual foods or a uh, group of foods. The first thing that I can, the, the first uh, one that I can think of, uh, for example, think about the general principle of food hygiene, which also, if you ever, I imagine that you did enter a, a, a restaurant or a bar, you will sometimes see a sort of a, a, a card saying, uh, H-A-C-C-P, the Hazard Analysis and Critical Control Point, ASAP, uh, which is a core part of the general principle of food hygiene. Codex developed the ASAP. And uh, the other one, the other codes aimed at the prevention or reduction of chem chemical or mineral contaminants such as mycotoxin, acrylamide, heavy metals, and you, again, we will have a look and how to find them, how to read them at the end of the session. But they are, again, they are all available for free on the Codex website. Uh, moving on to the next one. Oof, this is a quite tough one. Uh, <laughs> a quite um, full, I would say, slide, uh, because we have more than 20 uh, um, active Codex committees at the moment, which develop standards. We have seen uh, that uh, standards um, uh, can be about different topics, and the same goes for uh, Codex committees. We have, for example, Codex committees on food labeling. We have Codex committees on the mm -hmm. Codex committee on pesticide residues, food hygiene, food, food hygiene just basically concluded its work, although they still have to adopt the, the final report this week, but they just concluded uh, the, the work uh, last week in San Diego. And I see some of you that were also attending the CCFH session. Um, then we have, and these committees, uh, the first ones like uh, food labeling, food hygiene, are called the, the general committees or sometimes the horizontal committees because they develop, let me say, 
Uh, probably in English, the right word would be cross-cutting concepts and principles applying that, that, that apply to food, to food in general, uh, but also to specific foods or to group of foods. Um, on the second column, then you will see the vertical or also called the commodity committees like uh, uh, CCFFV, the fresh, the, com the College Committee on Fresh Fruits and Vegetables. These uh, committees basically develop standards for, for specific foods or for classes of foods. Um, on the third column, you can see what we call the task forces, which are uh, ad hoc committees established for specific reasons. For example, the, the latest one was the one on antimicrobial resistance uh, chaired by the Republic of Korea. And finally, of course, we have the FAO WHO Regional Coordinating Committees. I'm happy to have uh, Daniela Vivero as one of the moderators of the session. She is also part of the CCLAC Secretariat. Also, regional coordinating committees develop, can develop standards, regional standards in particular, if there is a need for, for a member to, or for more than one member actually, to develop a standard for a specific, for example, commodity important for the region. I'm about to pause because as I told you, I don't really like to listen to the sound of my voice for way too long. But before that, another important part that I really wanted to stress before we move forward is that Codex is based on science. The foundation of Codex is, uh, and the Codex standards is sound scientific evidence. Now we have uh, four expert bodies that regularly provide science uh, scientific uh, advice to Codex. I say regularly because, for example, we also receive um, the contribution and the scientific advice of the IAEA, the International uh, Agency for the Atomic Energy, uh, which, for example, provides scientific advice on uh, um, radio contamination in foods. Uh, but we have four main, uh, let's say, uh, expert bodies that uh, provide scientific advice to Codex, which are JECFA, JMPR, Gemra and Gemnu, too many acronyms. I know dif difficult uh, to learn in, uh, in in a second, but let me go through each of them. So JECFA is the Joint FAO WHO Expert Committee on Food Additives. The second one, JMPR, is the again the FAO WHO Meeting on Pesticide Residue. Third one is the FAO WHO expert meeting on microbiological risk assessment. And finally, the FAO WHO expert meetings on nutrition. Now I'm not gonna talk about the role of science here uh, because I know that one of the webinars uh, that have been scheduled for the next year will talk specifically on the role of science in Codex. So I guess, uh, my colleagues uh, will be talking more about this part. Again, I just want you to know that uh, codex standards are based on sound scientific evidence, and this is really, really important for you to note. But um, as we were mentioning uh, a few minutes ago, uh, codex standards are voluntary in nature. So it means that they need to be translated into the national legislation, into the national law, if you prefer. Uh, this is not really up to the Codex Secretariat to say how to implement them. Uh, and we cannot really say that, actually, uh, not even for the Codex Alimentarius Commission. But it is, it is really up to you, to the, to the countries, to, um, to do that. I'm going to switch to Spanish. Y podemos contar hoy con la participación de la licenciada Tania Fosado, que también es el punto de contacto de, de Codex de México, que no va, nos va a hablar justamente de cómo México está implementando las normas del Codex en el sistema nacional y se encontraron problemas, cuál es, cuál es la ruta que, que siguen. Entonces, Tania, muchas gracias por estar aquí con nosotros. Te doy la palabra. Gracias, Tania, y adelante. Muchas gracias, Giuseppe. 
Eh, ¿Me escuchan? Sí. Ah, muchas felicidades por el webinar. Eh, sí. Consideramos muy importante este tipo de eventos para familiarizarnos de cómo se armoniza con respecto a las diferentes regulaciones en los diferentes países de la región y sobre todo pues apoyarnos en los diferentes procesos y somos más de 200 conectados, así que pues muchas felicidades por, por la promoción de este webinar. Eh, voy, a, voy a hablar del caso de México. Eh, México es miembro de la OMC desde 1995, como, como ya este, hablamos de, este, de esta organización muy importante, pues México es parte del acuerdo de, de obstáculos técnicos al comercio de la OMC y tenemos la obligación de tomar las normas internacionales como base en la elaboración de nuestros reglamentos técnicos. La figura de los reglamentos técnicos en México eh, se llama norma oficial mexicana. Eh, es muy importante notar que las normas internacionales son la base, es decir, el piso, y no necesariamente el techo de la regulación mexicana, ya que si hubiera un objetivo legítimo de interés público a atender, que no se ve en la norma internacional, las autoridades eh, mexicanas que emiten la regulación, pudiendo ser eh, Secretaría de Agricultura o la Secretaría de Salud, pudieran atender eh, estas necesidades eh, con la norma y la regulación técnica de manera adicional a los parámetros que ya se encuentran eh, en los estándares este, internacionales. En el caso de México, eh, si nosotros tenemos una regulación técnica más restrictiva que lo que esto establece la norma internacional, de debemos tener una justificación legítima para los miembros de la OMC. Eh, esto en realidad se da para casos excepcionales, eh, ya que eh, en general nosotros armonizamos con las normas internacionales para no crear eh, obstáculos o barreras innecesarias al comercio. Eh, para considerar todo esto, eh, nosotros tenemos una ley nacional que se llama Ley de la Infraestructura de la Calidad, que rige la elaboración de las normas oficiales mexicanas. Esta ley, eh, en su artículo 34, establece que se deben de utilizar como base estas normas internacionales eh, y, bueno, de acuerdo a la materia deben de ser aplicables y establecer el, el grado de concordancia con estas normas. Eh, se señala si es idéntica, si es modificada o si es no equivalente, según sea el caso. Eh, también la ley eh, prevé la participación de México en los trabajos de los comités internacionales y bueno, eh, llevar todo esto a los paneles internacionales para eh, elaborar normas internacionales. Y esto se hace a través de comités mexicanos para presidir, eh, coordinar y representar al país en todos los eventos relacionados eh, con normas internacionales, velando que sean representativas para nuestro, nuestra situación y nuestro comercio nacional, ya que nosotros por ley estamos obligados a observarlas. Eh, en estos comités mexicanos participan los diferentes sectores eh, in interesados, ya que se busca eh, elaborar esta postura que contemple eh, la visión del consumidor, del productor, del agricultor, del comercializador, etc. Y bueno, en la actualidad en México existe un comité mexicano de atención al Códex que revisa todos los trabajos eh, según el comité y este comité eh, es coordinado por la autoridad responsable y la experta en el tema, por ejemplo, para el caso del Comité de Higiene es la Secretaría de Salud, para el caso del Comité de Frutas y Hortalizas Frescas es la Secretaría de Agricultura, y bueno, se coordina para elaborar y establecer eh, grupos de trabajo eh, nacionales también que revisa cada documento del Códex. Eh, por todo esto, para México la labor del Códex se vuelve crucial para sentar las bases técnicas para el desarrollo de nuestras regulaciones nacionales, para proteger nuestros objetivos legítimos a nuestros consumidores y facilitarnos el comercio y la armonización eh, a nivel eh, internacional. Y bueno, o sea, nosotros estamos en el entendido de que, de que todo este comercio de alimentos crece muy rápido, que las labores del Códex son cada vez eh, pues más este, especializadas. Eh, para el caso de México, por ejemplo, existe la norma 223, es la norma oficial mexicana de queso, 
y nice toma como base la norma general del Codex para queso para disposiciones products. generales Mexico y establece que las especificaciones para cada variedad de queso deben tomar como referencia standards. las normas internacionales de Codex eh, para cada estilo de queso. Eh, como ya bien saben, hay una norma del Codex para mozzarella, para cheddar, eh, estas normas están referenciadas en nuestra norma de queso y bueno, ya que son productos de, de consumo nacional y, y bueno, hay, hay un comercio significativo para estos productos. Eh, México tiene aproximadamente 107 normas oficiales mexicanas de armonizadas con el Codex Alimentarius. Eh, pues por todo esto eh, y esta armonización que aparte regula nuestra ley, Estarán, estarán viendo la participación activa de México en los diferentes e importantes foros eh, del Códex y pues, y pues a la orden. Muchas gracias. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Tania Fosado, uh, Codex Contact Point for uh, Mexico. Thank you very much. So this would conclude uh, the first part of our webinar so in the first part we have seen uh, codex standards we know now that we have at least three different types of codex standards we have the standards the codes of practice the uh, the guidelines codex also as we mentioned during the presentation uh, sets uh, maximum residue limits and uh, maximum levels for for example for veterinary drugs for pesticide residues in food um and again as mentioned before we're gonna have a look and how to find them uh, where to find them how to download them how to read them also at the end of the session now moving on to the second part the second part would be and i still hope that you can see my screen uh would be about circular letters and electronic working groups which also form part of what we call the basic codex text and actually these are really important for you. If you want to engage with Codex, as Tom was saying, it is really important for you to participate actively in Codex. And reading the circular letters, participating in electronic working groups is essential if you want to contribute to the work of Codex. Now, the circular letters. So circular letters are used to implement the recommendation of codex committees. Um, they are used to request comments on uh, draft standards. For example, uh, if you if you participated in one of the codex committees, you will always find a uh, document compiling all the comments are coming from members and observers again let me stress this one more time and observers on a um, codex uh, um, standard guideline or code of practice uh, we're gonna have a look an example uh, right after this slide uh, but we also use uh, circular letters for example to collect comments on other topics but let's say the main purpose of uh, uh, circular letters is to really request comments on uh, draft standards. We now use a software, an online software that is called the Codex Online Commenting System, the OCS. Again, another new acronym for you to learn today. Um, don't worry, I'm going to share my presentation with, with all of you, so <laughs> you don't have to take note at the moment. Um, this uh, online commenting system uh, is a tool uh, by which the codex contact point enter comments uh, and send comments um, on different draft standards. And then we have the electronic working groups, the invitation letters, uh, which are used to invite members and observers to participate in an electronic working group, uh, especially the kickoff messages um invite members and observers to register and to join the electronic working group they provide details on the work of the electronic working group they provide also the deadline for registration and then also a link uh to actually join the discussion online which we hold on the codex forum now this is what a circular letter looks like um, for example, this is a 
circular letter requesting comments at step eight on the draft regional standard for dried meat. Now, I know that many of you participated in, in the first module of this series of webinars, so I'm not going to spend much time on the step procedure, but I also know that there are people that know almost nothing about Codex or that are joining us for the first time. So let me recap the Codex uh, step procedure in a few words. Uh, we have eight steps in the Codex step procedure. So it takes eight steps for a standard to be adopted. Let's say uh, we start from uh, what I call inappropriately step zero, where we have the idea of developing a standard, the need uh, for having a specific standard. Think about having a standard for a, for a, for a specific commodity. For example, my uh, I come from from Sardinia, which is a lovely island here in in Italy, and we have there a pear, a different pear, which is different in taste, flavor, and shape to any other pear that you can find uh, around the world. Let's say that Italy wants to develop a standard for that, then here is where step zero occurs. When we think about uh, developing a standard, when we collect the, the, the basic information, the data, the data that we need, that we need the importance also of, uh, at trade level uh, of having a standard for for the let me call it the sardinian pair um then we move to step one two three four and five where basically there we uh collect for example step three uh initial comments from the members and the observers to see um the status of the of the draft standard if there is a for example a part or more than one part that need to be updated and uh, further developed and if members agree then the standard is then said the sent to the um, step five where basically is what we, uh, uh, how we say is ready for adoption at step five which means that the commission will uh, give a sort of a, a first uh, adoption to the text which will then go through another circle or cycle of comments uh until step eight so when then the standard is sort of uh going for final adoption to the codex alimentarius commission again i'm taking some things for granted as this is the second module of the webinar and uh, but again i'm gonna share with you some useful information about the eight step procedure at the end of the webinar and also uh, the recordings of the first webinar are available online and my colleagues uh, uh, from FAO have kindly already shared the links into the chat. Um, again, just to simply recall that uh, Codex texts are developed by the Codex Alimentarius subsidiary bodies, CCFH, the Codex Committee on Food Hygiene, for example, and then sent for adoption to uh, the Codex Alimentarius Commission. In this case, going back to the circular letters, what we see here is this is that this circular letter is requesting comments at step eight on the draft regional standard for dried meat. And if you want to comment on such standard, for example, you have to carefully read the request for comments. Well, first of all, the deadline. So you need to provide deadline the, the comments by the deadline, in this case, the 4th of November but you really have to read. And this is something that I really stress with uh, my colleagues, with the, with my friends also from, from the members, please read carefully the request for comments section. Because here we ask you, not really, not the Codex Secretary, but the, the, the Codex community, the Codex family, as Tom was saying, is requesting you specific comments. In this case, as the standard, is going for comments at step eight. Comments, and it's always like that, should address whether the text is ready for adoption or not. And if not, we invite members and observers to provide the rationale and proposals to facilitate adoption. We don't want to reopen the technical discussion at the commission level. We think, not we, the, the, the Codex members, 
uh, think that uh, the uh, discussion, the technical discussion has been completed and therefore the standard is ready for adoption, sent to the commission and there um, the, the text gets adopted. So this is a circular letter, an example of a circular letter. Another example of the text that we use in Codex is the invitation letters to electronic working groups. Uh, for example, this is uh, the invitation letter for uh, the management of unsupported compounds without public health concerns scheduled for periodic review by JMPR. Wow, quite a long name. Um, chaired by, in this case, uh, Chile. And I see some colleagues from Chile online. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, again, description of work that you will find all the useful information uh, regarding the work that the uh, electronic working group will carry out, who the chairs are, who the co-chairs are, the working languages, in this case, English and Spanish, the timetable for work, and in the second part that I didn't include right now, you will find all useful links to register to the electronic working group, how to join the electronic working group uh, forum, and so on. Once again, I've been talking for quite a lot already, and um, I'm really happy uh, to see and to have uh, with us uh, the Codex contact point of uh, Guyana. Um, let me see if Miss Scott is with us. I can I can see her. Um, thank you very much, uh, Miss Scott, for, for taking some time for being us, uh, for being with us today. Um, and apologies for the problem with the presentation. Um, we see, um, I have a question for you, um, Miss Scott. Basically, I'd like to know if you can tell us more about um, how Guyana shares circular letters and relevant codex documents at national level. And the other question that I have is, um, I'd like to know why, if so, for Guyana is so important to participate in codex work. Uh, Miss Scott, thank you. You have the floor. Over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the floor. So my name is Sumatra Scott, and I am the CCP from Guyana. So in Guyana, all of the circular letters and the documents that are received, they're received by myself, the Codex contact point, and that is via our Codex email. So as the documents are received from the Secretariat, they are first circulated to our National Codex Committee, and that would be along with the deadline that's given for the submission of those documents. So the relevant documents, they would be downloaded, whether from the website or sometimes they're on the online commenting system, and they would be sent to the technical persons in the National Codex Committee that would have been assigned to that subcommittee. So for instance, whether it's uh, for the Codex Committee on Food Additives, for Food Hygiene, etc. So also at times you may find that you might need some other necessary documents uh, relating to that particular circular letter. Maybe there's some background information, some links. So we would download all of that regular um, relevant documents and they would be sent to the relevant technical persons. So they would review those documents and a time, time frame is usually given. And that would be prior to the deadline of the document and that's given for them to submit any comments. So when it, any comments are received, they are usually then circulated back to our National Codex Committee as a whole for their approval endorsement before we usually submit anything on the online commenting system. In terms of the importance of our participation for our Codex work, uh, in Guyana, uh, participation in Codex, it allows our country to really keep updated on any information and any ongoing discussions as it relates to food safety, to food standards, and it would assist us in developing our national legislation on food safety. So through our participation in codex work, we can ensure that the standards being developed, they don't negatively impact our country. We're able to have access to sound scientific evidence as it relates to food safety, uh, because indeed standards are important and they play a very significant role in the trade for us. Thank you. 
thank you very much, uh, Ms. Scott. Thank you for joining us and uh, thank you for the detailed explanation. Um, I see there is a question, if you don't mind, Daniela, since we are on, on this point, uh, um, there is a, a question coming from Luis, San, Luis Santa Maria on how, uh, how do EWGs work? Uh, again, um, my colleagues will uh, further talk about this section in future, in future webinars, but let me spend a couple of minutes on that, if you don't mind. Um, Okay, let me see that. Uh, let me say that uh, during the step procedure, um, sometimes a codex committee uh, decides to establish an electronic working group to address a specific point, to address uh, a, a question. For example, it could be to uh, develop a standard to start the the let's say the 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 first. Um, draft of a standard to work together with the experts uh, to collect data, to collect information. And again, electronic working groups are established by a codex committee. Now, can the Codex Alimentaris Commission establish an electronic working group? The answer is yes. Uh, can any subsidiary body of the uh, uh, Codex Alimentaris Commission establish a working group? Again, the answer is yes. So now, imagine the eight-step process as a sort of a um, linear, let me say, road trip from point A to point B, uh, going through step one, two, three, five, until A. Sometimes it may be the case that a committee sees that a standard is not really ready for adoption. So what the committee does is sending back a draft to the electronic working group uh, to a previous step, for example, to step two, so that the expert can address the issues. For example, this happened uh, uh, maybe in 2019, if I recall correctly. Yes, I see that uh, the CCP of Mexico is still with us, so she can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, with the proposal for a draft standard for dates, which was sent back to the electronic working group because it needed it needed further consideration. Um, there were a few paragraphs that needed to be further discussed that the solution couldn't be found uh, during the, the committee. So it was sent back to the electronic working group to uh, address uh, the depending issues. So, Luz, I hope this answers your question. But again, my colleagues will uh, talk in uh, further details about electronic working groups in future sessions of uh, these series of webinars. We almost at the end of my presentation. I've been talking for more than one hour already. Um, final part of my presentation and let me please tell me if you can see my presentation correctly now in in full view i hope so thank you very much um so the final part is about the information documents now what are information documents sometimes we forget about information documents but they are also part of codex basic text um, these information documents are developed by codex committees, by the codex sub subsidiary bodies, uh, due to what we call actually the occasional need. It's not a rule. They don't really develop uh, information documents every time, uh, but they, based on, on occasional needs, they do develop information documents, which actually have to be developed and agreed upon by a codex committee um, have to contain useful information. Again, this is really important. Have to, um, this information is to be uh, useful for members, observers, but also for national governments. And again, they are not considered, um, uh, let's say, uh, appropriate by, by a committee to be adopted as a codex standard, nor to be included in the procedural manual. Just to give you a few examples, uh, we have uh, the guidance for risk management options in light of different risk assessment of uh, assessment outcomes, or 
um let me say about uh, let me talk about one that is not included here but is the uh information document on how the codex committee on food hygiene considers new work or now it establishes new work we're almost there but i still want to talk about an important part of codex basic text which are the codex reports if you know nothing about codex if you just join codex if you want to know more about codex if you want to know uh, again going back to the question of Lewis, why uh, we have uh, an electronic working group why we are issuing a circular letters a circular letter why we are developing a specific standard here is where you will find this information codex reports now uh codex reports include reports from of course the codex alimentarius commission the final report of the codex alimentarius commission cac 45 will be made available by the end of the year we're going to adopt the final report next week um then we have of course reports from ccfh from the subsidiary bodies of course ccgp the codex committee on general principles ccpr the codex committee on pesticide residues I'm, I'm really sorry for the interpreters i know qu quite a lot of new acronyms <laughs> for you as well um and all reports are uploaded on the codex website they are all available on the codex website and we're gonna have a look at them together but what i want you to know in the meantime ed is that if you're new to codex if you know nothing about codex if you are the giuseppe that joined codex almost eight years ago probably this is where you would like to start from open a codex report and go to the summary and status of work there you will find everything that happened in a specific codex committee you will find the main summary of the decision of the commission of the committee of a commissioner again um and there you will find the actions so for example if you look at the right column i know that it's a bit small for you to read it entirely but you will see that there were text that were sort of sent for adoption at step eight five eight by the committee which means that the committee considered those standards ready for adoption by the codex alimentarius commission and by reading the columns by reading for example text topic draft standard for dried meat step step eight and for example the paragraph paragraph 40 if you go through the report go to uh, paragraph 40 you will find all the necessary information regarding the adoption of that dried uh, of the draft standard for dried meat so i talked about the actions required by uh, the commission the members the step finally actions by electronic working group here we say that for example this is a part of the um, codex committee of spices and herbs uh, you will find uh, basically uh, the reason why we are having a for example an, an, an electronic working group working on the drafts uh, draft start that for cardamomon uh there uh um why we are establishing a an electronic working group uh working on the draft standard for turmeric and so on apparently there is a typo I, i'll leave it as a as an easter egg there is a typo in a, in a report a funny one if you if you read carefully this report you will find it but um i'm not gonna mention it right now I probably need to tell my colleagues to fix this this report <laughs> auto correct sometimes uh, really kills us um but in any case also here uh you will get all the information to know why we are establishing an electronic working group why we have such an electronic working group and so on I'm almost done I would say I'm done where can I find codex text well the answer is the codex website so let me go to the uh to the codex website so that we can really have a quick look at it together and um, because i still get lost every now and then on the codex website let me see okay here we go okay this is the codex website for me uh, really uh if you're new to codex this is 
also another good starting point. We going back to where we started from, Codex Text, right? So if you want to read, download, and find the Codex Text, just look at this bar over here, go to Codex Text, of course, and click on it. Immediately, you will find all the information that we talked about today. Not just that, but also, for example, the information regarding the ad state procedure in this lovely uh, infographic. You might want to read it because this is really useful, especially if you are new to Codex, to uh, get to know all the important um, steps and what happened, uh, what happens at each step during the development of a standard. And if you go to the right column here, you will see view the complete list of codex text. Just click on it and you will be redirected to the uh, complete list of codex text. We have more than 370, if I recall correctly, 371. Yes, I am correct. Good memory. Um, 371 uh, Codex text um, on different topics, on, uh, mm, for example, Codex standards for, for, for Apple, uh, the mm, Code of Hygienic Practices for different products, uh, the guidelines as well. Um, sometimes, again, this is a the classic example that I give. If you cannot find what you're looking for, you can use this useful uh, Google search uh, feature over here on top right of, of the Codex website. For example, if I type here ASAP, I won't be able to find it because there is no a standard called ASAP, Codex standard for ASAP or, or so on. It is a part of the hygiene uh, uh, text. So you just go here and type ASAP and you will be redirected to the page and uh, to the result page. And as you can see, that would be the first result. So you just simply need to click on it and you will find all the information you were looking for. So this is for uh, Codex standards, Codex text. As I was mentioning before, we also have the online database. If you go to the same column, Codex text, online database, Codex online database, you will find the three database on pesticides, residues in food, veterinary drugs, uh, residues in food, and the general standard for food additives. Again, um, the, we, let me give you a spoiler. We are uh, about to finalize the new version of the Codex Alimentarius website, which is going to be even more user-friendly. Uh, uh, we'll have new uh, tools that will really facilitate your life and your work. Uh, we we will announce it next year, so don't let me give you too many spoilers, but just please um, know that this is going to happen soon. Um, going back to the second part of the uh, webinar, we talked about the circular letters. So going back to the initial bar, resources, just click on circular letters and you will find all the circular letters that are actually currently out for comments. Again, look at the deadline um, because this is really important. We want to receive uh, your comments within the deadline because then the Codex Committee, not, not just the Codex Secretary, but the Codex Committee will have to analyze them uh, sort of in a timely manner to also uh, guarantee that the discussion at committee level will just go fine and as planned and i would say just to facilitate really the discussions there um if you want to know what codex is currently working on this is the page for you you need to uh, look at this page you really need to uh study this page and you probably want to also prod your colleagues in your uh, national codex committee uh to really Keep an eye on this page. Electronic working groups, almost done. Committees, electronic working groups. Here you will find all the electronic working groups currently open for business, let me say. 
uh, with the inf invitation, which is what we just seen together, the direct link to the forum. Now, uh, Luz, uh, going back to your question, another important point for you to know and for, uh, for all our colleagues online is that the Codex contact point actually authorizes who can participate in a electronic working group. Uh, this is to ensure a level of transparency, security, to so that also the chairs of the electronic working groups know that that person, that expert, has been authorized by the member. And this is, again, another important task of the Codex contact point. Finally, um, another part that for me is really important is the publication section. This is an amazing page for me uh, because here you will find basically uh, my tears and stress. <laughs> I work quite a lot on, on, on publications as well. And, but it, it is really also important for you to know more about uh, codex, about publications, about the standards. Look, for example, uh, this is the new look and feel of uh, codex standards, what codex standards will look like in the future uh, with a new design, with the digital object identifier that will uh, also monitor downloads and citations of codex text. So this is what we are currently developing and the same design will be used for uh, all codex standards. If you didn't download it yet, if you didn't read it yet, please download also our um, magazine, the Codex magazine, the 2022 magazine, which was um, recently announced at the commission. If I scroll down quickly, I just want you to focus on two publications, two more publications. The first one, Understanding Codex. If you have no knowledge of little knowledge of Codex, or if you want to refresh your memory and your knowledge of Codex, download this publication. It includes everything you need to know about Codex. Although the publication has been published in 2018, it is still relevant. You will find all the basic information about Codex. And finally, Codex and WTO, Trade and Food Standards. If you want to know the, the let's say, um, why Codex standards as you are used as benchmark, what it means for Codex standards to be the benchmark used by WTO. This is the publication that you need to download, that you need to study carefully. Uh, I will stop here and I'd like to remind you that we also have a Codex Twitter account, uh, which is quite active. And I would like you to, if you didn't already, to follow our Twitter handle, which is uh, FAOWHO Codex, as simple as that, um, which is quite frequently uh, updated. And I'm not saying that because I Thank do you, that, Jeffrey, but you. also because I do that. So if you haven't followed the Codex Twitter handle yet, please do it now. your presentation. I'm going to give the floor to Marco Pino. Marco, you have the floor. Marco, you need to turn on your mic. Still mic off, Marco. Okay, well, we have to wait for Marco to reconnect. Seems that we've, it seems like we've lost him. We have a question from the chat. And I think we have another question here about the documents and 
Giuseppe, what you're uh, showing the documents on PDF and all that, my question is, are these available in Spanish? Uh, codex, uh, code of practice, uh, or the reports, all of them are available at least in the in English, French, and Spanish. Um, if you go, let me let me quickly show it to you if I can, real quick. Uh, this is the Codex website. Of course, on top right, you can switch to Spanish, for example, if you wish. And you will find the same information in Spanish. Let me go to to the, for example, the Codex standards. On this right column over here, you will find uh, all almost every time the six official languages. We are working to complete uh, the pending uh, standards in in Chinese, Russian, and Arabic to have them available on the website. But if you click, for example, on on the Spanish version of a standard you will see that the standard is also available in Spanish. This one, for example, is the standard for, for mice. Um, yeah, so all codex standards are available in, in all languages. And also the information that I shared with you today are available in, uh, is available in uh, uh, Spanish as well. Thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe. I, I think I see Gustavo's hand raised. Yes, Giuseppe, thank you. And from Bolivia, from La Paz, uh, I am a member of the Bolivian Codex Elementarius and I am interested in knowing a little more about some document that whether it has been already drafted, um, what to what extent are these standards, codex standards, being harmonized in the different Latin American countries? Because in Mexico, I understand that they have over a hundred harmonized um, standards, uh, codex standards, and I'd like to know what is going on in all of the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean because I want to know the percentage of Co uh, uh, codex uh, standards, uh, how, how many have been harmonized? Because that's a very important information for us, for those of us who are putting together, gathering, collecting uh, information for the codex. So since Jose knows the info, Giuseppe knows all the information about the number of documents available. So Bolivian Codex would be interested in knowing a little bit more about this, uh, how many Codex elementary standards have been harmonized across Latin America. Thank you very much, Gustavo. Thank you, Daniela. Um, this is a really interesting question. So um, let me take you by the end and uh, let's go back in, in, in time. Uh, in the past, we had what we call the adoption procedure, where a, a, a member would inform the Codex Alimentarius Secretariat about the uh, number of uh, Codex uh, texts that they had adopted. Now, um, as you know, um, Codex standards are voluntary in nature. So with time, it was impossible for the Codex Secretary, but also for the members to inform us about the exact uh, percentage of number of texts that had been adopted uh, by, a, uh, by a member state. And also because that was not really mandatory. So that was probably um, uh, made on, on, on a voluntary basis by the state. So the information was not precise, was not uh, up to date as well. Now, uh, again, it's not really up to the Codex Secretariat to monitor how many uh, standards have been adopted by a member state. Nonetheless, we have, ju uh, have just issued a new survey on the use of codex standards, on how basically how many standards have been uh, adopted or are being being used by um, codex members, not just in the Latin American region uh, and the Caribbean region, but uh, worldwide. 
So we're gonna share the results, I imagine, uh, by um, mid 2023. So we start to give you a precise number. I would like you to wait until, uh, uh, unfortunately, I would like to ask you to wait until uh, mid next year. Thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe. I'm not sure if Marco is already reconnected to make sure that he can ask his question. We can see Marco, we can see you, but we cannot hear you. Something is wrong going on with his mic. I can't hear him. We cannot hear him. We will try our best. There is a question that Marco posted on the chat. Perhaps I should read it. Maybe his question is uh, this one. So Marco is mentioning, hi, Giuseppe. I please explain the mandate and the scope of the codex protecting the health and ensuring good practices for um, for food trade and uh, safety of the Apple, food. I okay. still have it here, still safe. Uh, the mandate of Codex is to protect consumer health and uh, to facilitate fair practices in in the food trade. <laughs> um, public concerns about food safety issues often place Codex at the center of uh, global debates. We can talk about food drugs, we can talk about pesticides, uh, we can talk about food additives. These are issues discussed in Codex meetings. Again, I guess it's important for, for me to stress it one more time that codex standards are based on sound science provided by, again, independent international risk assessment bodies or ad hoc consultation organized by um, <laughs> FAO and WHO. And codex standards really contribute to ensuring uh, safe, good quality food everywhere in the world and they by by ensuring the um let's say um good quality safe food they also contribute to facilitating uh fair practices in the in the food trade because if one country knows that that food is safe to consume it will be more inclined either to import or export that food as a consequence uh thank you Thank you, Giuseppe Monor de Ville. Would you like to take the floor? I think you raised your hand. Yes, Daniela. Good morning, everyone. You know that in Haiti, we also use the codex norms, uh, standards, and we have a committee that works on the adoption of these standards. which mostly come in PD on PDF uh, formats. And the committee sometimes is asks, asking for a word version to be able to facilitate the adaptations, the editing uh, efforts that we are making. And so we need to, if we need to enter some changes uh, to the documents, we need uh, that uh, facilitation, okay. And maybe it, could be possible to have the uh, updating mechanisms to provide Word files to be able to facilitate life for the committee members who need to edit or bring annotations or, or suggestions to the table. I'm really happy to see, Daniel, if I may, I'm going to take this one. I'm really happy to see uh, our colleague from Haiti. I was really happy to uh, meet him uh, at the last session of uh, Lac, although only uh, virtually. And I really hope that we will be able to add French as a new language for Lac in the future to facilitate also the participation of IT in the work of Codex, although my French is terrible because I'm Italian and I have a terrible accent in, in French. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, 
uh, to to answer your question, if you have a specific need, uh, if you need to have a Word document of a specific codex standard or codex text, you are um, invited to send me an email or to send an email to codex at fao.org and we will be more than happy to support you and support IET. Thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe. I have two questions that are on the chat. First one is what relationship is there between the OMC and the Codex Elementarius? Do they have common objectives in terms of harmonizing no standards to increase or to invite more uh, world trade of foods? Okay. Okay. Let me start with this one. Um, how many hours do we have? Uh, okay, no, I guess I guess we only have a few minutes. Um, okay, thank you for for you, for your question. This is a a, a tough one uh, because it would require actually some time for me to be uh, precise. Yes, uh, when it's up to harmonization, when it's up to um, facilitate trade worldwide. Yes, codex standards and and trade and WTO. I would say go hand in hand uh, because they really uh, work together to facilitate uh, a trade at worldwide level. Um, as I was mentioning in, during my presentation, codex standards became the benchmark for uh, uh, for the WTO, um, which means that, um, for example, uh, the WTO in case of a dispute recognizes codex standard as a benchmark for solving such a dispute. But again, having harmonized standards, having um, a some sort of a, a common field on which we can uh, um, trade, really facilitate the, uh, the international trade. And yes, we work, for example, the codex secretariat works quite frequently with the uh, TBT and SPS secretariat to also address uh, any issues that may arise. Um, it is really about uh, harmonizing international uh, food safety laws in this case. Uh, but again, I don't want to enter now into this discussion because um, giving you uh, these details in five minutes won't be probably correct. And uh, this is a topic that I know will be covered by another webinar and probably my colleagues or probably myself as well. I don't know. Um, we will talk about this for more than one hour, definitely. So I, in the meantime, uh, I would stop here. But again, um, I invite you in the meantime to download the publication called Trade and Standards, which is available on the Codex website, which includes all the um, uh, necessary information re related to Codex and WTO. Over. Thank you, Giuseppe. Now, the last question that we have here, could you uh, elaborate on whether or not more works of the codex have been are being carried out right now i'm not sure i read this properly maybe uh, the person asking the question would like to ask it because i kind of understand think that whether or not there have been any works done on the on the foods well yes the question has to do with whether the work if the committees have worked any further if there is a project or something that we cannot uh, that we can already look at mm, straight answer no <laughs> not, at the moment. No, no, not at the moment uh, not yet uh, we didn't receive any requests from members at the moment. We didn't receive any proposals for the mem from the members at the moment. Um, we have uh, recently started uh, 
discussions on novel foods, which is something that um, CC for example, recently examined, and also the commission, the last session recently examined. Um, novel foods would probably include also this topic, but at the moment, um, no members nor observers have uh, raised such such proposal or such questions in in codex. So currently, no works on CBD. Thank you, Giuseppe. Does anybody else have any other additional uh, question? Gustavo, go ahead. Yes, Giuseppe. Well, uh, fortunately, knowing that this taking advantage of this CCLAC meeting, I'd like to ask another question, not just as a national Bolivia Codex, Codex Committee, but as a to the scientific committee because I'm concerned and I have my questions about the application and the importance that uh, of the good uh, farming practices. And as a scientist as I am, I am, that is very related to everything that has to do with the uh, standards for regulating pesticides and also the standards that have to do with the antimicrobial resistance. And therefore, I think that these two could be, uh, these two issues, pesticides and antimicrobial uh, uh, practices. Uh, if, and I would like to know if these works are being done to have some reference uh, standards so that we can study the application of these standards in our different countries. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Gustavo. Unfortunately, but or, but also fortunately, I would give, I would have to give you the same answer that I have just given you uh, because. Exactly, uh, these topics are going to and are part of the survey that we have recently issued, and uh, also to see uh, how members in not just in the region but again uh, at worldwide level have uh, been applying uh, the codex standards. How and to what percentage they they are? Let me say I don't want to use the word respecting, but. Uh, uh, let me say again, considering translating um, uh, nation, uh, into the national legislation, for example, uh, the maximum residue limits for uh, pesticide residues, or even, for example, we recently adopted two texts on antimicrobial resistance to see to what level they are applying that uh, uh, those standards. We are also working on uh, a few case studies uh, exactly on this topic. You can find one about the ASAP, which is available on the Codex website, which includes basically all relevant information on how the ASAP has been applied in, in a few countries. Uh, we are preparing something similar uh, exactly on pesticide, but also on veterinary residues in food, and if I recall correctly, also on food labeling. Um, but again, we are working on that, and everything is going to publish to be published by, let's say, 2023 and 2024. Um, because the data that I have now, the, the numbers that I have now are a bit out of date, and uh, it, it wouldn't be fair for me to share them with you right now because they, they are not the current data. And I don't know if you want to listen to data that are a bit. Thank you, Joseph. We have a comment from Mexico. In Mexico, technical rules, not official in the sec economic secretary, which for trade information, we are identifying risks related to health of people, related to com fair commercial transactions. In Codex, do you identify this risk? If so, how do you measure these risks? Adelante. 
Okay. Um, I know that this is going to be part of another webinar, but let me let me simply give you a few uh, a few notes about that. Um, we have uh, four independent scientific bodies that um, analyze risks and uh, that provide scientific advice specifically also on these points. Um, we we talk about the risk associated to human health and um, uh, e to which percentage a, for example, uh, let me give you an example, cadmium could hurt the health of a person, the, the consumer health, and so on. These are all defined by is the initially by the FAO WHO scientific bodies, but also then by a, a codex uh, subsidiary bodies. Um, this is sort of a, another sort of long part. And uh, again, I don't want to uh, take another half an hour because giving you a short answer wouldn't be correct right now. Uh, but I will share with you the relevant information where to find uh, uh, a more precise answer on the Codex website and on Codex um, uh, text uh, via the chat. And also, if you leave me your email, I can send you an email with this information. Well, thank you very much, Giuseppe. In this case, Johannes, can you put your email in the chat? We'll take note and move it to Giuseppe. Any further questions, comments? I don't think so. Diogenes. You sent us your email that you're asking if we will send this by email. We'll send the contact points online where you can find the information on the webinar and the recording also. We will be wrapping up now. Thank you again, Giuseppe, for accepting our invitation. I think it was a, a great webinar with lots of useful information. We have a large number of attendees and this means it was interesting Maria Angeles do you want to add something or otherwise we'll be wrapping up questions I will play the mail of CC like Ecuador so we can coordinate an answer otherwise we'll be finishing let's turn the camera down for our picture thank you